the book of Acts and chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, we are um, learning many things about uh, the first century church initially and then churches, and we find the work of God uh, multiplying now around the world. We are in the midst of Paul's second missionary journey. In his first, there was uh, the emphasis was in Asia Minor, and now he's crossed over uh, into Macedonia, and he arrived in the city of Philippi, and as we've looked at this particular chapter in uh, Philippi, the work of God is uh, a little different than usual. Compared to Asia Minor, where he would typically go first to the synagogue, he would preach the gospel, and in many instances, we find many people believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and coming to a saving knowledge of Christ. But here in Philippi, which is a Roman colony, the work of God has been slow. All that we've seen thus far was that at the beginning of the chapter is one woman by the name of Lydia believed and was baptized. And it seems that uh, they congregated there in her home. She invited them to come to their home. By the end of the chapter, we know that before Paul and Silas leave Philippi, they're going to meet together in the house of Lydia. And we know that it was there in Philippi that uh, Paul was falsely accused. There was a, a mob that came against him. Uh, the magistrate of the city commanded them to be beaten, uh, severely beaten, and so then they were committed to prison. About midnight, we see that an earthquake happens, and we um, looked at the end of this chapter, and there's two aspects that we've looked at in the life of Paul. There is both what we've identified as lessons that we can learn from, from Paul's ministry as, as a minister of Christ, as a Christian in prison. But there's a second aspect that we're going to look at this morning. I dealt with the, the one last week with his ministry. This week I want to deal with some lessons that we can learn from Paul as a Roman citizen. It is not just here in Acts chapter 16, but it is also in Acts chapter 21 and 22, where Paul is going to be adamant about his Roman citizenship. And so there is a sense here that although Paul wrote in the epistles that we are uh, citizens of heaven, that we still have a life on earth. And our life on earth must still bring glory to God. We should not have the mindset of, well, I don't care about what goes on in the world. I just can't wait to get to heaven. Although I hope there's an expectation that we're looking forward to that. But we should not neglect our life on earth today. And so we're going to look at that second aspect. We're going to begin reading in verse 25 of Acts 16. And the word of God says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. Now, the impulse, I think we all know, would have been from all of us, We've been falsely accused, committed to prison, the bands are loose, the doors open. What do you think about? Run. <laughs> God has opened the door for your freedom. That's not what happened. And I made the point last week, let me repeat the points because I think they're important. I think they're important. Is that Paul was suffering as a servant of the Lord. But he did not allow his suffering first, notice, to hinder his praise of God. While he was in prison, he praised God. He also did not allow his suffering to blind his perspective. He could have ran, and that would have been, I think, all of our impulse. Freedom! The bands are loose, the doors open, let's go. But he stayed. We also see that he did not allow his own suffering as the basis to revile his persecutors, the keeper of the prison, was about to kill himself, and Paul stopped him. He could have just thought to himself, well, God has allowed the situation. The man's going to kill himself. It'll be an opportunity for us to be free. This is God's doing. No, he did not allow his suffering to revile his persecutor. And also, he did not allow his suffering to produce a callous spirit towards others. You know, often that is, we are shaped often by our circumstances, by what happens in our lives. And often as a result, 
We stop praising God. We have a, a blind perspective where we are unable to see the doors that God opens and the things that God does in our lives where we allow the difficulties in our lives to use them as tools against others who we feel stand against us. And also often we may allow things in our lives to say, sometimes you may feel or say to yourself when you go through difficulty as well, so and so they just don't understand and we may use that as an excuse for a callous spirit. Paul did not allow that. And by the way, as we noted last week, it was in his suffering that God brought about the greatest work in Philippi. All that we've read about so far is there's one woman that believed and that said Lydia, but here the uh, keeper of the prison is going to be saved in his entire household and they're all going to be baptized. That's an amazing thing. And that happened through suffering. And so we continue here in verse 27 of Acts 16. And the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told the saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. As we noted last week in the last verse, it is Paul and Silas who did the comforting. We might think after this time of suffering that they might go to the house of Lydia and the brethren that are there might comfort Paul and Silas because they've been through a season of suffering, but that is not what happens. Paul and Silas are the one who are comforting them. Now, the Bible tells us that we are able to comfort others with the comfort that we have been comfort, comforted of God. And so there's a sense that when God comforts us, God will use the comfort wherewith we have been comforted to comfort others that need comforting. Now, with those things in mind, in the midst of this chapter, I uh, did not address those verses here where there is a debate between the magistrates and the sergeants that are sent to bring message to the jailer to let Paul go. And uh, Paul does not agree with, with going and to kind of be let off loose. Uh, we see here as we think about those terms, let me give you a, maybe a definition of those words. We see that there is magistrates, there's uh, sergeants, and then there's the keeper of the prison. Now, a magistrate, as we read here, remember that this is a Roman colony. So this is dominated by Roman rule. So this is not what you would find have found in Asia Minor and much of those cities. They were not... Although they were under the Roman Empire, they were not, those cities were not Roman colonies, but Philippi is a Roman colony. So when you read about the magistrates, these are governors or chief. Um, as we have noted in Philippi, being a Roman colony meant that the magistrates would probably be military commanders who would often act as judges. Uh, if there was, uh, it would be uh, much similar that today if you had a, 
uh, someone who joins the military, if they do something wrong, they're tried by a military court. Uh, in other words, they have their own court system within the military. And so this would be the same. Uh, Philippi was a colony. And so those who are, uh, if you would, the judges of those places are uh, com military commanders. Then you have the sergeants. Well, the word sergeant simply means a rod holder. So the magistrate would be the one who represents the rod, the one who represents authority, the one who represents the judge. The sergeant, the rod holder, is the one who carries out the bidding of the judge. And so he is considered the executioner of the demands of the magistrates, of the commander. And then you have, thirdly, the keeper of the prison. Now, we've already read here this would be a Roman soldier who was entrusted uh, to keep the prison, to keep the prisoners in the prison. And so the keeper of the prison simply means a jailer. And there is a debate as we look at our text here, just so that we note a few things. Early on, before we read our text, the magistrates sent the sergeants saying to those men, you can go. Now remember what had happened before. Uh, early on, uh, Paul and Silas had been beaten uh, openly. If you notice with me in verse 36 and 37 of Acts 16, the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And so Paul and Silas had been beaten openly, which means that they had uh, been punished publicly as if they were the worst of criminals. That's what Paul says. They, they've beaten us openly as if we were criminals. And Paul, when he, uh, he, he says that, he says then that, and by the way, we were uncondemned, untried by the Roman law, and we are Roman citizens. And when they heard that, the Bible says they feared. Now, their fear here is I don't think that they feared God, per se. I don't think that they feared Paul or Silas. They probably didn't fear the fact that they had done an injustice. Uh, their fear, they did not fear maybe a reprisal in the future that God would judge them. Most likely they feared that what they had done might go back to the Roman Senate and that the Senate would find them as unjust judges and that as a result they would lose their position of authority and probably suffer severe punishment. In that time in the Roman army, anybody who st stood outside of line was severely punished. In the, in the example when we read in our text here that the jailer was about to kill himself, the reason he did that is because if any prisoner escaped under his watch, he would be killed as a Roman soldier. Why? Because he hadn't fulfilled his responsibilities. That's why he was about to kill himself. Because he's going to die anyways. And so uh, they would be, they probably feared that word would go back to the Roman Senate and that they would be, uh, their position of authority would be taken from them and that they would suffer severe uh, punishment. So much so that we read in verse 39, and they came and besought them. So the magistrates came. Remember, Paul says, they need to come to us. They need to explain themselves. And the magistrates come, and the Bible says, and they besought them. The word besought, it's interesting. It's, a, it's an endearing term. It means to bring near. Those same men who had commanded Paul and Silas to be beaten, uncondemned, openly, are now beseeching them. That shows that they experienced guilt for what had been done, for what they had done. Now, as you hold your place there, I, I think it's important here to, to see that this is not the only time that Paul does this in the book of Acts. If you hold your place here in Acts chapter 16, and turn with me to Acts chapter 22. In Acts chapter 22, I think here we've, it's a, a parallel account by way of application. Different Now, in here in Acts 22, Paul is captured in Jerusalem. Here, Acts 16, he's in Philippi, a Roman colony. 
In Acts 22, he is in Jerusalem. Now remember, it had been announced before he shows up, a prophet came to him and said, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be in prison. They're going to capture you. Now he still went to Jerusalem. And, and here we have this interaction because there is, a, again, the same type of thing happened. There was a mob that went after Paul. And finally, the, the Romans got involved because they're the ones that had authority. And notice, let's just begin reading in verse 22. Um, Acts 22, verse 22. And they gave him audience unto his, this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Now that's the people, the mob talking about Paul. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust in, into the air, that had been quite a sight there, they're so angry, they just grab dust from the ground and just throw it up in the air. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging, that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. So apparently the mob says, away with him, this man shouldn't live. And so the Romans who had authority took him into the castle. So now he is not under the mob, but he is under the Roman rule. And the typical, if they couldn't get any word out of a prisoner to get him to admit to crimes, they would scourge him. They would beat him. And so they don't know what Paul has done, but they're thinking, well, if we beat him, we might know what he has done to incite this mob against him. Verse um, 25, And as they bound him with uh, thongs, uh, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? So notice that's the same thing that he had said in Acts 16. I am a Roman citizen and I am uncondemned by the law. I haven't been tried. And you have no right to scourge a Roman citizen. Verse 26. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. Now remember, where did Paul come from? Troas. Anybody that was born in Troas, and that was not true of all the Roman Empire, but anybody that was born in Troas was automatically a Roman citizen. Now apparently, this man here who is the chief captain had to purchase his citizenship of freedom. Many, time, many people during that time had to uh, uh, give a great sum of money to buy a Roman citizenship, which meant what? Freedom. But Paul was born free. He was born with that freedom. Verse 29, Then straightway they departed from him which should have examined him, and the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. So you see here, it's the exact same reaction in both cases. The one in Philippi, when they scourge him and they beat him, they put him in prison and then they found out he's a Roman citizen and they're afraid. And here later in Jerusalem, the Romans grab a hold of Paul and they're about to scourge him and he says, are you sure you want to do this? Because I'm a Roman citizen. I was born free. And they feared both cases. So in both instances, it's interesting, Paul in both instances was attacked by what I would define as mob rule. The mob uh, got stirred up against Paul, and uh, in the case of Acts chapter 16 is when he cast out the evil spirit from that woman, remember, uh, he had been preaching the gospel and the mob stood against him, and Jerusalem was for preaching the gospel and and in both cases, it was mob rule. In both instances, also, Paul was uncondemned by the law. In both instances, he says, you haven't, I haven't broken any laws. In both instances, fear came upon those who were ready to punish a man who was innocent when they realized that he was uncondemned. Uh, that gives us the idea that we have today when we say, when we say, Innocent until proven guilty. Um, that is a good thing, by the way. Uh, that nobody should be uh, condemned and punished 
There should be no assumption of guilt and of wrongdoing until that person has been proved to be guilty. But remember, the stirring came from the mob. They don't care about justice. Uh, and the mobs typically don't care about a sense of justice. Uh, we've uh, seen that in America itself. But we also see that in both instances, Paul declared his Roman citizenship. Now, to me, that is interesting because when we read the epistles, for example, let me give you a few examples. Uh, now, this is not uh, Paul, but Peter. But Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And so he says, we're citizenships of heaven. We're a holy nation. He says, Then, dearly beloved, I beseech you then as strangers and pilgrims in this world, he says, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may buy your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So there's a dual thing that is going on in the thought of Peter and the thought of Paul, that yes, we are citizens of heaven, but we still have a life on earth, and our lives on earth ought to be lived with extreme carefulness, for the glory of God. Uh, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, this very church. And he said this in Philippians 3.20, For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. And so Paul reminded those believers, those very same believers in Philippi, you're a citizen of heaven. But you must be careful how you live your life on earth. And so Paul, I want to preach here a message, the earthly life of a heavenly citizen. The earthly life of a heavenly citizen. As I mentioned here, we can compare Acts chapter 16 and Acts chapter 22 and see many things, but I want to bring just a few truths, and although I said I'm going to preach a message, I gave you the title, we're almost done. <laughs> but in both instances, I think we can learn some things that we can apply in our lives, because often if we're not careful, if we're not careful, there could be two extremes that come out of the idea of our life on earth, as citizens of heaven. On the one hand, we might get to the place where we're so focused and consumed in the affairs of the world that we lose sight that our citizenship is in heaven. But on the other side, we can just focus on our citizenship in heaven and be careless about our life on earth. And so there's extremes on both ends. On the one hand, we, uh, uh, we can just uh, uh, be uh, so consumed in the things of the world that we... And by the way, if you look to the world, you're going to be discouraged. You're, you're going to be de depressed. You're, you're going to uh, uh, be in turmoil if that's your only focus. You, you might say when you look at the world, there is no hope. And by the way, you would be right. There is no hope in the world. But we are citizens of heaven. And therefore, there is hope. And by the way, we know how it all ends, do we not? On the other hand, we can get to the place where we're just careless and we don't care. Well, it doesn't matter how I live in this world just because I'm a citizen of heaven and so it doesn't matter what I do. No, it does matter what you do. It does matter how you act. It does matter uh, your interaction with regards to uh, society, uh, to governments, and to the kingdoms of this world. The first thing we notice, and, and, and I guess we can... Think about in both instances in Acts chapter 16 and Acts chapter 22. The first thing that we learn in both instances is that Paul was acquainted with Roman law. 
Paul was acquainted with Roman law. It's interesting here that although he grew up as a Jew, he was born in Tarsus, which uh, historians uh, believed and have indicated that anybody who was born during the time when Paul was born in Tarsus automatically was a Roman citizen. Not everybody had the opportunity to do, so, to do so. Many people had to purchase their freedom and their citizenship as Romans. But that means that Paul enjoyed a certain amount of freedom under the law. Now, again, this is not typical. We're talking about the Roman Empire. The way the Roman Empire ruled is that they ruled over other nations, but they didn't destroy all the other nations, but they ruled over those nations. Many of those nations would have their own government, but they would always answer to the Roman Empire and to the Roman Senate. Uh, but uh, there would be uh, specific places and perhaps colonies or particular places throughout the Roman Empire where people, by virtue of where they were born, would have an automatic Roman citizenship. And I think it's important for us to think, uh, and by the way, we, we live in the United States of America and we enjoy great freedoms and uh, prosperity that many people around the world do not enjoy. And I know we might get in our minds that, look, things are not looking good. Look at all around you. But I, I, I maybe would try to help you think about other nations around the world. Because if we're not careful, we might think about, oh, look, at this is, this is so bad here. I would invite you to travel around the world to really see how bad it is compared to what we have here. Take a trip to China, for example. You cannot speak the name of Jesus Christ. You must meet if you're going to church. They have, if you go to a meeting place, you have to do no certain words and certain codes to be able to get in. And when you sing, you have to whisper. America sounds pretty good right now. You can go to countries where, uh, uh, where government are, uh, takes so much from their population that they have not much left at the end of the month for themselves. And so I know that as we look around us, we may focus on all the negatives. Uh, but often I think we have to be reminded of, look, we, we do live in a society, but whatever society we live in, I think that there is a duty among us that we might be familiar with wherever country we are in with the laws of that country. We, we must know what the laws are that, to that country and how we have a responsibility to those laws and how we interact with those laws. So we have to be knowledgeable. I'll just give you an example. You know, two years ago when COVID hit, uh, I was talking to several pastors, and a lot of the pastors that I interacted with were from, um, you know, Oklahoma and uh, Arizona. And, and it's interesting that there was a different reaction to, uh, to COVID with regards to local government and states. As a matter of fact, some states acted like there was really nothing, nothing really changed. But things changed for us. You know, one of those things is they told us we, we couldn't have services. They said the number went down to 10. And then they even told us how, I know we, we made sense to forget about, they even told us how to conduct our services and how long we could meet and how often we could meet. Well, we know what I did. I we went to our state constitution. And you know what our state constitution states? It declares that our state government has no authority, no authority to tell us as a church what to do. Now again, we might think here at this point here, I think Paul here, he, he, he says the same thing here because he says, look, I know the law and as a Roman citizen, I have a certain amount of rights. And so I believe it's important for us not to be ignorant of the rights that we do have and to be careless of why it doesn't matter the rights we have in this world. No, it does matter. And sometimes we can use it to our benefit. And here Paul uses it to his benefit. If he hadn't said nothing, what would be the outcome? He was only let go and free because he was a Roman citizen. Well, in Acts chapter 16. And so Paul was acquainted with Roman law. Uh, and by the way, there are people who live around the world who do not have the same law that guarantees their freedom like we do. 
So Paul was acquainted with Roman law. The second thing we notice in both instances is that Paul acknowledged his Roman citizenship. And so there's a sense here that I, I know we are citizens in heaven and our, uh, this world is not our home. We sing we're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And so we understand that, but we also have to acknowledge our Roman citizenship. And we have to remember that Scripture still declares that governments are ordained of God. Now, at this point, we might think, well, I don't like that. Well, to be honest with you, it doesn't matter what you like or don't like. God ordained government. Now, in Romans uh, chapter 13, if you turn there with me, Romans chapter 13, Paul writes to the church at Rome. And by the way, Rome would be in the center of, of the Roman Empire. And what does he say to those Romans? He says in Romans 13, 1, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror uh, to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers uh, attending continually upon this very thing. Now let me make a, a, a brief point here. Nobody that I know of that is a rational person likes to pay taxes. Anybody like that? You would raise your hand and say, oh, I, I, love, I love it. No, nobody likes that. But here he says, pay tribute. Jesus himself, he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And so we might get into this, this mentality as Christians, well, well, I just don't like what they're doing with my money, and I don't like what they're doing with my money. But the truth is, again, this law applies to everybody in our country, and everybody pays taxes. And if somebody doesn't pay taxes, then there's consequences for that. And might be we also be reminded that there are people who live in a socialist setting who also pay their taxes, and they're Christians too, and they don't like it at all. But they still do it. Now, the general idea here of government is that government was instituted of God for what? Well, it's basic. For the punishment of evildoers and for the reward of them that do good. And sometimes if we're not careful, we might focus and we say, well, I don't want to do this or I don't want to pay taxes because they're not handling my money correctly. And we focus on the negative, but often we have to be reminded of the positive. They still pay to enforce the law. They still often, in many cases, they'll stop crimes, although some cities are not. <laughs> But do you get the point? Is that sometimes we focus, I don't want to do that because they're doing something that's bad with it. But we also have to think about the good. And it's not something that we have to do, that other people don't have to do. We all have the same citizenship. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he, he uh, basically uh, says the, the same thing. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, during the time when you think about First and Second Peter, I want you to think for just a moment about the Roman government. Uh, Nero. Do you know what he did to Christians? He accused Christians of trying to overthrow the government. They were never interested in doing that. But he accused Christians of trying to overthrow the government. And so he captures many of those Christians and he... He drove a stake through their bodies. Then he would light them on fire to put light in his backyard. That's the kind of society they lived in. Do you know what Peter says to those same believers who are experiencing those things? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that ye, with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free 
and not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. And so we are free to do what? To serve God in a corrupt society. And even to sometimes do things that we might not agree with, but to understand that all citizenry goes through the same thing and has to do the same thing, that we not look upon ourselves and say, well, I'm just not going to do, do things and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand against the government. I'm going to rebel against the government. The agenda of the church is not to protest against the government. The agenda of the church is to declare the gospel. That's the agenda of the church. And it is important for us when we think about uh, nations and, and governments that we not become distracted by, their, by the injustice or the unfairness, but that we might become focused with what is our responsibility. Paul acknowledges Roman citizenship. But what we find also is that Paul was concerned with his reputation in relationship to the law. Paul was concerned with his reputation in relationship to the law. Did you notice what he said in Acts 16? He said, uh, you have beaten us openly, uncondemned. What Paul is saying is that you treated us as if we were the worst criminals of society. And I cannot let that go. I cannot let that go. Why? Because he is interested in his reputation to, the, to Philippi, to the citizen of Philippi, who don't know what Paul has done. They think to themselves, Paul, worst criminal. Well, what is Paul concerned about? He's concerned with preaching the gospel. And he doesn't want to have this reputation to be a criminal in a society where he wants to preach the gospel. He wants to have a good reputation among men. And so he's not going to let that go. He says, you, that's why he wants them to come to prison. He wants the magistrates to say that Paul is an uncondemned man, that he is justified, that there is nothing that Paul has done to stand against the government. By the way, that was the accusation against Paul. He's trying to, he is changing and attacking the customs of, the, uh, of Philippi. He did no such thing, but that was the accusation. And so Paul was concerned with his reputation and relationship to the law. We must be very careful as we deal with our relationship to the laws in any society that we do not live in such a way where we might cause others to look and to, uh, to, to, to basically, uh, when it comes to our reputation, to say, well, these people have no regard for the law, and then to nullify our effectiveness in this world. Paul had been accused of things that were untrue. And yet he wanted to make sure that the case was cleared, that his name was cleared in relationship to the law. If you turn with me to Acts 16, go there with me again, Acts chapter 16. Paul had been accused early on in Acts 16, verse 20, that he was teaching the customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. He had done no such thing. Same thing in Acts 21. He's trying to subvert. You know, it's interesting that when you look at study church history, that many times a government tried to stop Christians, and the accusation has been they're trying to subvert the government. Now let me say this, that has been the accusation, but that has never been the truth. That has been the accusation, but it's never been the truth. I'm not interested in saving government, it's unsavable. But I'm interested in preaching the gospel. I was reading here... So we, we say, the question is, so when do we stand, Pastor? I'll give you an example. There was the trial and the incarceration of John Bunyan. Uh, John Bunyan was a Baptist preacher in England. Uh, he was incarcerated in the Bedford Jail. And 
This following account, just a portion of what went on between the judge and John Bunyan, took place in his trial. And this is a, a small transcript of the trial that happened on October 3rd, 1660. Uh, judge uh, Wingate opens uh, the trial by saying this, Mr. Bunyan, you stand before this court accused of persistent and willful transgression of the conventicle act. You say, what is that? It's this, which prohibits all British subjects from absenting themselves from the worship in the Church of England. Everybody at that time was forced to go to the Church of England. That was the law. They had to go to the Church of England. And from conducting worship services apart from our church. And so John Bunyan was holding services, his own services that were not part of the Church of England. You come presumably with no legal training and yet without counsel. I must warn you, sir, of the gravity of the charge, the harshness of the penalty in the event of your conviction, and the foolhardiness of acting as your own counsel in so serious a matter. I hold in my hand the deposition of the witnesses against you. In each case, they have testified that to their knowledge, you have never in your adult life attended services in the church of this parish. Each further testifies that he has observed you on numerous occasions conducting religious exercises in and near Bedford. So John Bunyan has never been in the Church of England. By the way, that was the law in England. You had to go to church, to the Church of England. John Bunyan replies, The depositions speak the truth. I have never attended services in the Church of England nor do I intend ever to do so. Secondly, it is no secret that I preach the word of God whenever, wherever, and to whomever he pleases to grant opportunity to do so. I have no choice but to acknowledge my awareness of the law which I am accused of transgressing. Likewise, I have no choice but to confess my guilt in breaking the law, nor repent of having broken it. Further, I must warn you that I have no intention in future of conforming to it. Judge Wingate says, It is obvious, sir, that you are a victim of deranged thinking. If my ears deceive me not, I must infer from your words that you believe the state to have no interest in the religious life of its subjects. John Bunyan says, The state, my lord, may have an interest in anything it wishes to have an interest in. But the state has no right whatever to interfere in the religious life of its citizens. Judge Wingate says, The evidence I, told, I hold in my hand, even apart from your own admission of guilt, is sufficient to convict you, and the court is within its rights to have you committed to prison uh, for a considerably long time. I do not wish to send you to prison, Mr. Bunyan. I am aware of the poverty of your family, and I believe you have a little daughter who unfortunately was born blind. Is that not so? John Bunyan says, It is, my Lord. Judge Wingate says, Very well. The decision of the court is this. Inasmuch as the accused has confessed his guilt, we shall follow a merciful and compassionate course of action. We shall release him on the condition that he swear solemnly to discontinue the, conv the convening of religious meetings and that he affix his signature to such an oath prior to quitting the courtroom. That will be all, Mr. Bunyan. I hope not to see you here again. May we hear the next case. And John Bunyan interrupted and said, My Lord, if I may have another moment of this court's time. Judge Wingate said, Yes, but we must, you must be quick about it. We have other matters to attend to. What is it? John Bunyan says, I cannot do what you ask, my Lord. I cannot place my signature upon any document in which I promised henceforth not to preach. My calling to preach the gospel is from God, and He alone can make me discontinue what He has appointed me to do. As I have had no word from Him to that effect, I must continue to preach, and I shall continue to preach. Judge Wingate says, I warn you, sir, the court has gone the second mile to be lenient with you out of concern for your family's difficult straits. Truth to tell, it would appear that the court's concern for your family exceeds your own. Do you wish to go to prison? John Bunyan says, no, my lord, few things that are that I wish, that I wish less. Judge Wingate says, very well then, Mr. Bunyan. This court 
will make one further attempt in good faith to accommodate what appears to be strongly held convictions on your part. In his compassion and beneficence, our sovereign Charles II has made provision for descending preachers to hold some limited meetings. All that is required is that such ministers produce licenses authorizing them to convene these gatherings. You will not find the procedure burdensome, and even to you, Mr. Bunyan, must surely grant the legitimacy of the state's interest in ensuring that any fool with a Bible does not simply gather a group of people together and begin to preach to them. Imagine the implications were that to happen. Can you comply with this condition, Mr. Bunyan? Before you answer, mark you this, should you refuse. The court will have no alternative but to sentence you to, pr to a prison term. Think, sir, of your poor wife. Think of your children, and particularly of your pitiful, sightless little girl. Think of your flock, you can hear you, uh, who can hear you uh, till their heart's content when you have secured your licenses. Think on these things and give us your answer, sir. To which John, uh, John Bunyan replied, My Lord, I appreciate the court's effort to be, as you have put it, accommodating. But again, I refuse your terms. I must repeat that it is God who constrains me to preach. And no man or company of men may grant or deny me to leave the leave to preach. These licenses of which you speak, my Lord, are symbols not of right, not of a right, but of a privilege. Implied therein is the principle that a mere man can extend or withhold them according to his whim. I speak not of privileges, but of rights. Privileges or licenses granted by men may be denied by men. Rights are granted by God and can be legitimately denied by no man. I must therefore refuse to comply. To which Judge Wingate replied, Very well, Mr. Bunyan, since you persist in your intractability and since you reject this court's honest effort at compromise, you leave us no choice but to commit you to Bedford jail for a period of six years. If you manage to survive, I should think that your experience will correct your thinking. If you fail to survive, that will be unfortunate. In any event, I strongly suspect that we have heard the last we shall ever hear from Mr. John Bunyan. Now may we hear in the next case. By the way, it was in the Bedford Jail that John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress. So it was not the last you heard of John Bunyan. You say, Pastor, when is it okay to break the law? The moment the state constrains you to do something that will be a violation of what God has commanded you to do. But I think it's most interesting that John Bunyan never advocated for violence against the state. He just said, your law is unjust. I do not ever intend to keep the law because it is unjust, I intend to obey God. And we must be very careful that our priority does not become a fight against the state, but that our priority be obedience to God. That's exactly what John Bunyan is saying. You are preventing me from obeying God. I will obey God no matter what it costs me even if it means breaking your laws. You see, the law was not applied equally. The ministers in the Church of England were granted licenses, but those who were outside the Church of England were not granted licenses. And so, when that happens, we choose to obey God. John Bunyan chose to obey God no matter the consequences. Not through violence. Not even through protest. You know what John Bunyan did after he was arrested and uh, he was released? He went back and preached. He didn't stand outside the courtroom with pickets, with signs and, you know, and picket and says, freedom, freedom, freedom. He went out and did what God told him to do. 
And we must be very careful that, yes, our citizenship is heaven, but while we're on the earth, how can we be good citizens on earth? Just obey God. Don't frustrate yourself by standing against the state. Submit yourself to God, no matter what the state says. And be faithful to God. You see, John Bunyan might be perceived by those of the day as he is standing against government, but all he saw was that he was obeying God. That's all he was doing. And so may we do the same. Paul was familiar with the law. He used the law. He claimed his Roman citizenship. But as soon as they stepped outside of that and were unjust, he stood against it. To do what? So that he could continue to preach the gospel. And so may we think the same way.